This video is a summary of the Bitcoin Standard, a book by economist Saifdean Amus. If you had to read only one book about Bitcoin and Austrian economics, this is the one to read. Chapter 1. Money Money is the solution to a problem that has persisted for all of human existence. That problem is how to move economic value across time and space. The simplest way for people to exchange value is to exchange goods with one another directly in a process called barter. The problem with barter is that it only works in small groups with only a few goods and services produced. For the purposes of this book, a good is anything you want to sell to another person. A good can be your labor, services, expertise, food, gold, livestock, etc. Literally anything you want to sell is considered a good, including money. As societies grow, the opportunity for specialization increases, and more goods and services are possible among more and more people. This creates a growing problem called the coincidence of wants. The problem of coincidence of wants can be broken into three subcategories. Coincidence of scales, coincidence of time frames, and coincidence of location. In other words, it will become less and less likely that you will meet a person who coincidentally wants what you have to offer in exactly the amount you want to sell at precisely the time and location you want to sell it. Imagine wanting to sell shoes for a house. You can't buy the house in small pieces, nor does the homeowner want an enormous amount of shoes equal in value to the house. This problem compounds if the good is perishable or non-divisible, like food or livestock. The only way around this problem is through indirect exchange, which means that you temporarily exchange your goods for something you don't actually want, in order to try to find another person who will exchange it for the goods you do actually want. That intermediary good is called a medium of exchange. What tends to happen is that a single medium of exchange emerges for everyone to trade all goods for. That single medium of exchange is called money. The concept of saleability simply means how much do people want your good? The most desired good is money, and therefore it is said to be, by definition, the most saleable of all goods. There are three essential properties of money. Number one, medium of exchange. This is the most important function of money. Money is a medium of exchange because it is purchased in order to be exchanged for something else. Number two, Store of value. Money is a store of value because it preserves your purchasing power over time. Money should be difficult to produce, otherwise known as hard money. If it is easy to produce, otherwise known as easy money, people will produce more of it, driving its value down, which in turn makes it a bad store of value. Historically, the people who have chosen the hardest money, whether by choice or accident, have accrued the most wealth. The implications of hard or easy money go far beyond financial wealth. Those who choose a good store of value are much more likely to plan for the future than those who choose bad stores of value. The third essential property of money is a unit of account. A unit of account means that you price every good in the same unit of money relative to every other good, based on their relative scarcity. Money is the unit of account because everything is priced in money not in terms of other goods, which would get extremely complicated. A good measure of the hardness of money is its stock-to-flow ratio. The stock of the money is how much of the money currently exists, and the flow is how much of it is produced per year. Think of stock as all the gold in all vaults around the world, and the flow is how much gold is mined per year. It is no coincidence that gold was chosen as money, but instead it was chosen because it had the highest stock-to-flow ratio, meaning it was the hardest asset to create more of relative to its existing supply. The best money has a high stock-to-flow ratio, meaning it is the hardest to make more of it. Bitcoin is the hardest money ever invented because it will have an infinite stock-to-flow ratio and because it's impossible to create more than 21 million Bitcoin. Check out my previous video explaining why there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. The link is found below in the description of this video. Chapter 2. Primitive Monies Of all the historical forms of money, 
the one that most resembles Bitcoin, is the ancient system based on rye stones on Yap Island, which is today part of Micronesia. Yap stones were large, circular stones carved from limestone. Rye stones were of various sizes, weighing up to 4 metric tons. The limestone was not native to Yap Island, and all of Yap's stones were brought in from the neighboring islands of Palau and Guam. These stones were displayed in a prominent location in Yap, where everyone could see them all. Owners of the stones could use it as payment without having to move them, but instead announced to the town folk that the ownership of the stone has now moved to the recipient of the stone. There was no way to steal the stone, because the ownership was known by everybody. These stones were extremely difficult to produce, and as such, worked well as money for thousands of years. In other words, the rye stones had a very high stock-to-flow ratio, meaning it was very difficult to create more of them relative to the existing supply of rye stones. This was the case until 1871, when an Irish-American captain by the name of David O'Keefe shipwrecked on the shores of Yap Island. O'Keefe realized that if he could produce yap stones, he could pay the yappies people to harvest coconuts, thus creating a profit from taking coconuts from the island and selling them for coconut oil. Using explosives and modern tools, O'Keefe quarried several large yap stones. Initially, the village chief banned these stones created by O'Keefe because they were gathered too easily. Some islanders disagreed with the chief and decided to work for the newly created yap stones. This created a conflict and led to the demise of yap stones as money. The stock-to-flow ratio of the yap stones had decreased drastically, making it a poor store of value. A similar thing happened to the agri beads used as money in Western Africa, when European explorers and traders imported these beads into Africa in large quantities, diluting the money supply. This also happened with seashells, which were used as money in many places, from North America to Africa and Asia. Seashells eventually lost their value as money because they were too easily attained with modern technology. Other ancient forms of money include cattle and salt. In each case, as soon as the monies became easy to produce, they lost their hardness because the stock-to-flow ratio fell and they lost their store of value. Easy money does not make a society richer. On the contrary, it makes it poorer by placing all its hard-earned wealth for sale in exchange for something easy to produce. Safety in a moose. Chapter 3. Monetary Metals Due to their difficulty to produce, their durability, and their demand, metals began to be used as money. Some metals were more valuable than others because of their relative scarcity on Earth and their durability compared to other metals. Iron and copper were poor stores of value because they are both abundant and susceptible to corrosion over time. Gold and silver, on the other hand, are much more rare and much more durable, making them better monetary metals. Gold is especially durable and thus preserves wealth across very long time frames. These metals eventually began being minted in uniform coins, branded by their weight. Gold, silver, and copper coins were used as money for around 2,500 years, from the time of the ancient Greeks to the early 20th century. Gold coins turned out to be the best form of money because gold does not corrode. Why gold? The demand for holding a good for its own sake is called market demand. Holding a good as a store of value is called monetary demand. When someone holds something as a store of value, it effectively increases its monetary demand and the price of that good will rise. If people choose to store their wealth in materials with low stockpiles, like copper, zinc, nickel, brass, or oil, the price of that good will rise temporarily, causing people to pay more for the material and therefore obtain less of it than they would have at normal prices. In response to this increased demand, the producers of that material will increase production, making the price quickly drop, robbing the savers of their wealth. The net effect of this process is to transfer wealth from the savers to the producers of the commodity they purchased. In order to prevent this cycle, savers need to choose a commodity that has a large stockpile compared to annual production, meaning a high stock-to-flow ratio, and does not corrode. The commodity that best fits these properties is gold, 
which is why it has historically been the best store of value over time. Gold is also impossible to synthesize chemically, and so it can't be created artificially. This all means that the existing stockpile of gold is the product of thousands of years of production and is orders of magnitude greater than the new annual production of gold. The growth rate of gold supply has been relatively steady over the past 70 years, at around 1.5%. This is the lowest of any monetary metal, and is the reason it has held its monetary role throughout history and continues to hold it today. The high stock-to-flow ratio of gold makes it the commodity with the lowest price elasticity of supply, meaning it takes a very large increase in supply to move the price higher by a very small amount. Roman Golden Age and Decline Julius Caesar, the last dictator of the Roman Republic, created the Aureus coin, made of 8 grams of gold. This created economic stability for 75 years until a successor, Emperor Nero, began the practice of coin snipping, in which he would have the coins reminted into coins containing less gold or silver. Under successive rulers, the precious metal content of the coins began to be further reduced until only traces of the metals were used. This caused widespread inflation of prices, combined with artificial price ceilings, or price limits imposed by the leaders, making it unprofitable to produce goods and food. This caused a standstill in production. Coin clipping reduced the coin's value, which increased the money supply, allowing overspending, resulting in inflation and crises, causing more coin clipping to pay for more spending. This slowly led to the Roman civilization dispersing into populations of farming peasants scattered in isolation into the countryside, out of the cities, and eventually becoming serfs living under feudal lords. Byzantium and the Byzant The Byzantine Empire, also known as Byzantium, outlasted the Roman Empire, surviving for 1123 years. Their currency, the Solidus, was a gold coin that has since changed names to the Bezant and the Islamic Dinar. It was not debased or coin clipped and is still in use today. The Renaissance During the medieval times, peasants in Europe used copper and bronze coins as money, which was easily debased and proved to be a terrible store of value. The adoption of sound money began in Florence, Italy, in 1252, with the adoption of the florin, a coin which contained 3.5 grams of gold. The florin was in use for hundreds of years, leading to an unprecedented flourishing in Europe. The important role of sound money to the development of the Renaissance is often underappreciated. Isaac Newton, who was also the manager of the Royal Mint in England, adopted the gold standard in 1717, which is why England had economic supremacy in the region. This led to many other European nations adopting the gold standard. This chart shows the price of gold in terms of silver. This shows that silver is losing its value relative to gold over time. Because of this, countries like China that adopted the silver standard lost much of their wealth to countries on the gold standard. La Belle Epoque A case can be made that the second half of the 19th century, particularly after 1871, saw an unprecedented prosperity in Europe, unmatched in the world since, largely because of a uniform gold standard. Most major European countries adopted the gold standard during this time. Some of the most important technological, medical, economic, and artistic achievements were made during this time, which partly explains why it was known as the Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Era. Chapter 4. Government Money at the end of World War I, governments stopped allowing their money to be freely decided by their citizens and began imposing government money, or fiat money, on them. Fiat means by order or decree. So fiat money is decided artificially by a government, elected official or a dictator. However, contrary to the name, all fiat currencies originally were redeemable in gold or silver or a foreign currency, which was redeemable in gold or silver. Without the redeemability for gold or silver, 
governments would not have been able to impose the paper money in the first place. The first recorded example of a fiat currency occurred in China in the 900s, which was redeemable in gold or silver, but the government increased the supply of paper notes until the currency collapsed. The same thing happened later in China in 1260. Government money, or fiat money, is similar to primitive monies like the yap stones or glass beads in that their supply can be quickly and easily increased, which leads to destruction of the purchasing power of the money and ultimately the collapse of the economy. Monetary nationalism and the end of the free world. Within a few weeks of the start of World War I, all major combatant countries effectively went off the gold standard in order to print enough money to finance the war. This was done by stopping the redeemability of each paper currency for gold. Had governments remained on the gold standard, military spending would have been limited to existing gold reserves, and the war would have likely only lasted a few months, instead of four years. The evidence for this is that previous wars on the gold standard were extremely short-lived and not expensive. This shows the exchange rate of each major national currency involved in World War I in relation to the Swiss franc, which remained on the gold standard during World War I. This devaluation of each currency led to a centrally planned system called monetary nationalism, in which monetary policy is decided by individuals instead of the free market. Bitcoin, being outside the control of any government, offers an intriguing possibility for the emergence of a new international monetary system. The Interwar Era Before World War I, under the international gold standard, Money flowed freely between nations, and the exchange rate between them was simply the conversion of weights of gold. Under the new monetary nationalism, exchange rates between currencies were determined by agreements and meetings. In 1922, the Treaty of Genoa was enacted and was the first major law of monetary nationalism. Under this treaty, the U.S. dollar and the British pound were to be considered reserve currency similar to gold in other countries' reserves. This began the move toward the inflation of currencies in order to fix economic problems. England tried to use the pre-war price for gold in pounds, but there had been a huge increase in pound notes. This caused other countries to deplete Britain's gold reserves rapidly until England asked the U.S. to rapidly increase its own printing of money in order to help stop the exodus of gold from England to the U.S. The U.S. agreed and inflated the dollar throughout the 1920s, ending in 1928, right before the 1929 stock market crash, which led to the longest depression in modern recorded history. This depression was intensified by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal policies of keeping wages artificially high causing high unemployment and lowered production because employers couldn't afford their wages, while also keeping the price of agricultural products high, causing mass hunger. Producers of many crops actually had to burn their products in order to keep supply low and prices artificially high, while many Americans went hungry and without jobs. In order to allow even more inflation of the dollar, President Roosevelt ordered the banning of private ownership of gold, and forced Americans to sell their gold to the U.S. Treasury. This effectively outlawed the use of sound money in the form of gold. It was the prevailing view at this time that any rise in unemployment or slowdown in production was the result of shortage of spending. And in order to spend more, government simply printed more paper, diluting the value of all currency held by its citizens. This philosophy was known as Keynesian economics, after John Maynard Keynes who himself had not studied nor researched economics. The cause of the Great Crash of 1929 was the diversion away from the gold standard, and the deepening of the following depression was the result of government control of the economy and move away from the free market. World War II and Bretton Woods World War II saw unprecedented spending and low unemployment for those countries involved. Under the Keynesian model, all spending is treated equally because it all reduces unemployment. Whether that spending be of individuals feeding their families or militaries murdering foreigners is irrelevant to this ideology. During World War II, 
food had to be rationed, and construction of new housing and repair of existing housing had to be halted completely due to military spending. So the case can be made that war was bad for both soldiers dying in battle and also the families who remained at home. This military spending led to an enormous industry, causing President Eisenhower to warn of a growing military-industrial complex that controls government by demanding ever more funding and driving U.S. foreign policy toward an endless series of expensive wars with no rational end, goal, or objective. At the end of World War II, the U.S. summoned its allies to Bretton Woods in New Hampshire to create a new global trading system. The result of this meeting was that the U.S. dollar became the global reserve currency. Dollars would be redeemable in gold at a fixed rate, and the U.S. took gold from other countries to facilitate this agreement. The U.S. did not abide by this agreement and began altering the exchange rate in their favor. Bretton Woods introduced the International Monetary Fund with the purpose of stabilizing exchange rates between currencies. This did not work, and many countries devalued their currency in order to pay debts with money printed out of thin air, with no backing. Government Money's Track Record The redeemability of U.S. dollars for a finite amount of gold, combined with a potentially infinite expansion of the dollar supply, led to a higher gold price. As various countries realized the diminishing power of their inflated paper currency, they began to demand their gold reserves back from the U.S. French President Charles de Gaulle sent a French military carrier ship to New York Harbor to get France's gold back. When Germany attempted to reclaim their gold from the U.S., and with gold reserves running low, President Nixon ended the dollar's convertibility to gold in 1971. In effect, the U.S. has defaulted on its promise set about at Bretton Woods. This led to a rapid increase in printing of dollars, along with a rise in prices of virtually everything. Interestingly, the mainstream view blamed everything except the true source of the problem, which was the increase in the money supply, which dilutes purchasing power of the currency. This was a worldwide phenomena, as the global reserve currency was the U.S. dollar and it was rapidly increasing in supply. As an example of this diminishing purchasing power, in 1971, an ounce of gold was worth $35. Today, it's worth over $1,900. That means the dollar buys over 50 times less gold than it did just a few decades ago. Even the relatively low average inflation rate of 5% per year will double the money supply of any country in only 15 years. Hyperinflation, defined as a 50% increase in prices in one month, is an economic disaster that is unique to fiat money and has never happened under the gold standard. Hyperinflation has happened 56 times since the end of World War I and the abandonment of the gold standard. The most vivid example of a hyperinflating currency was that of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, which led to the breakdown of a leading world economy and also the rise of Adolf Hitler to power. Chapter 5. Money and Time Preference Sound money is extremely important for three main reasons. Number one, it protects value across time. Number two, it gives people an incentive to think of their future. And number three, it lowers their time preference. Time preference is the ratio at which people value the present as compared to the future. People will always prefer to have resources now than in the future. In order for someone to be willing to delay those resources, they must be confident that they will receive more if they wait. This is the central motivation for investment, planning, etc. High time preference is gluttony. Low time preference is rational investment in the future. Lowering the time preference allows people to cooperate, prosper, and live in peace. The problem is that fiat money encourages people to be gluttonous because their money will buy less in the future. This is because governments continually print money, meaning that there will always be a higher quantity of the money supply in the future. The only way low time preference works is with sound money that is limited in supply, like gold or Bitcoin, because their money will not depreciate in value in the future. A capital good is a good created in order to increase or improve future production. 
Creating tools instead of hunting is an example of a capital good. Monetary inflation. Inflation is when prices go up. Prices go up because the money supply goes up. The price of any good is best thought of as its proportion to the total money supply, not its numeric value. Its numeric value is totally irrelevant. Therefore, any quantity of money is sufficient to fill all monetary functions, as long as it is sufficiently divisible. A theoretically ideal money would be a money that is strictly limited in supply, meaning nobody could possibly create more of it. It's just a fact of history that if it is possible to create more money, people will do it, which makes the prices of everything go up for everyone. Inflation is impossible with Bitcoin because it is strictly limited in supply. Saving and capital accumulation. A major problem caused by a currency whose value decreases over time, or inflates, is that it negatively incentivizes saving for the future. If you can buy less in the future than you can now because of inflation, it is rational to spend and borrow lots of money now and to not save for the future. Sound money is the exact opposite. Sound money is money that gains in value over time, which incentivizes saving and planning for the future. Innovations, zero to one versus one to many. Sound money incentivizes investments in long-term and large projects. As a result, some of the most important innovations in human history occurred in the last half of the 19th century. In the book, The History of Science and Technology, the authors compile a list of over 8,500 of the most important inventions in science and technology ranked per capita, meaning how many of these innovations happened per person, controlling for population growth. The analysis found that, while the total number of innovations rose in the 20th century, it actually fell as a proportion of the population. In his popular book, Zero to One, Peter Thiel discusses the impact of visionaries who created the first successful examples of new technologies. The move from having zero to one of these innovations is the hardest and most important step, whereas moving from one to many is merely a matter of scaling, marketing, and optimization. Some examples of the most important innovations that occurred in this period of hard money during the late 1800s until 1914 are hot and cold running water, indoor toilets, plumbing, central heating, electricity, the internal combustion engine, mass production, automobiles, airplanes, subways, electric motors, elevators, heart surgery, organ transplants, baby incubators, radiation therapy, anesthetics, aspirin, blood transfusions, vitamins, Petroleum-derived chemicals, stainless steel, nitrogen-based fertilizers, which allow the existence of billions of people through fertilizing crops in third world countries. The telephone, voice recording, color photography, movies, etc. Artistic flourishing. It can be argued that the effects of sound money can also be seen in art and music. Wealthy patrons financed most of the famous artists and musical composers that we regard today as the masters of their art forms. Many of the greatest masterpieces of art and music were created under a sound monetary system, backed by gold. Chapter 6. Capitalism's Information System The cause of waves of unemployment is not capitalism, but governments denying enterprise the right to produce good money. Friedrich Hayek Hayek was an Austrian economist, which means that he believed that the money supply should be limited. He wrote an influential paper called The Use of Knowledge in Society, in which he argued that managing an economy is not just about allocating resources and products, but about allocating them with knowledge that is not available to any one person or group. In a free market economy, prices are literally knowledge and are the signals that communicate information. Each individual makes decisions based on the price of goods and raw materials they need to purchase. And these prices are a distillation of all market conditions into one actionable variable for that individual, which is the price. An example of how this works can be found in copper prices after an earthquake in Chile in 2010. The earthquake caused damage to the copper mines, 
resulting in a 6.2% increase in the price of copper. Anyone in the world who needed copper was affected by this without knowing anything about the earthquake. This immediately caused other copper producers around the world to produce more copper to take advantage of the higher prices, which in turn caused the prices of copper to fall because of the increased supply. Within a few days, prices of copper were back to normal. In this case, if copper prices were governed by a worldwide committee or a single person, how would they determine which consumers needed to limit their consumption of copper and by how much, when there are no real prices which reveal their preferences? It's not just that it's hard to manage an economy centrally. It's impossible. Capital Market Socialism Mises argued that socialist systems cannot work because they lack a price mechanism to determine the most efficient allocation of resources. Without this system, it is impossible to produce new goods or coordinate the production of existing goods. Centralized decision-making leads to a breakdown in production. The division of labor is the separation of tasks in an economic system or organization so that participants may specialize. While most understand the importance of the price system to the division of labor, few get the crucial role it plays in capital accumulation and allocation. In his 1922 book, Socialism, Mises explained the quintessential reason why socialist systems must fail. Given that lack of application to one's job was usually punished with government murder or imprisonment, socialism arguably overcame the incentive problem successfully regardless of how bloody the process was. After a century in which around 100 million people worldwide were murdered by socialist regimes, this punishment was clearly not theoretical, and the incentives to work were probably stronger than in a capitalist system. There must be more to socialist failure than just incentives, and Mises was the first to precisely explicate why socialism would fail even if it were to successfully overcome the incentive problem, the fatal flaw of socialism that Mises exposed was that without a price mechanism emerging on the free market, socialism would fail at economic calculation, most crucially in the allocation of capital goods. As discussed earlier, capital production involves progressively more sophisticated methods of production, which is increasingly impossible for a single person or committee to control. Business Cycles and Financial Crises in a free market, people decide to take out loans based on the interest rate and whether or not it is worth it to take the risk and cost to take out the loan. This determines the total amount of money loaned out in a free economy. Fractional reserve banking is a system in which only a fraction of bank deposits are backed by actual cash on hand and available for withdrawal. In a fractional reserve economy, the supply of loanable money is determined by a committee that is influenced or completely controlled by politicians, bankers, and sometimes military generals. These artificial price controls result in a shortage or surplus of whatever goods or capital that are being controlled, which causes large losses to the entire society because of overproduction or underproduction. This is the root cause of what is known as the business cycle. Business cycles also known as boom and bust cycles, are intervals of expansion followed by recession in economic activity. Recessions are caused by the manipulation of interest rates by central banks. This manipulation distorts the price signals that capitalists rely on to make decisions, leading to misallocation of resources and eventually to a recession. Whenever a government starts inflating the money supply, there are negative consequences. If the central bank stops the inflation, interest rates rise, and a recession follows as many of the projects that were started are exposed as unprofitable and have to be abandoned, exposing the misallocation of resources and capital that took place. If the central bank were to continue its inflationary process indefinitely, it would just increase the scale of misallocations in the economy, wasting even more capital and making the inevitable recession even more painful. Central bank planning of the money supply is neither desirable nor possible. Sound basis for trade. The abandonment of the gold standard in 1914 through the suspension and limitation of exchanging paper money for gold by most governments began the period called monetary nationalism. Money's value stopped being a fixed unit of gold, which was the commodity with the highest stock to flow ratio. 
which kept its value predictable and relatively constant. Instead, the value of money oscillated along with the vagaries of monetary and fiscal policy, as well as international trade. Imagine the sort of confusion that would happen to all engineering projects if the length of the meter were to oscillate daily with the pronouncements of a central measurements office. Making the meter shorter might make someone's house whose area is 200 square meters believe it's actually 400 square meters, but it would still be the same house. The redefinition of the meter would make an engineer's ability to properly build a house impossible. Similarly, devaluing a currency may make a country richer nominally or increase the nominal value of its exports, but it does nothing to make the country more prosperous. In a free market for money, individuals would choose the currencies they want to use, and the result would be that they would choose the currency with reliably the highest stock-to-flow ratio. The money that came closest to this was gold in the latter years of the international gold standard. Because a devalued currency makes exports cheaper, any country facing economic slowdown can boost its GDP and employment by devaluing its currency and increasing its exports. This brings us to the current state of affairs in the global economy, where most governments attempt to devalue their currencies in order to boost their exports and all complain about one another's unfair manipulation of their currencies. None of this would be necessary if only the world were to be based on a sound global monetary system that serves as a global unit of account and measurement of value, allowing producers and consumers worldwide to have an accurate assessment of their costs and revenues, separating economic profitability from government policy. Hard money. By taking the problem of supply out of the hands of governments and their economists and propagandists, would force everyone to be productive to society instead of seeking to get rich through the fool's errand of monetary manipulation. Chapter 7. Sound Money and Individual Freedom Governments believe that, when there is a choice between an unpopular tax and a very unpopular expenditure, there is a way out for them, the way toward inflation. This illustrates the problem of going away from the gold standard. Ludwig von Mises What Mises meant by this is that under a sound monetary system like gold, governments had to be fiscally responsible and avoid printing money to pay for government debts or to pay for new government programs. If it is possible to simply print money, governments will always choose that option, which causes inflation, decreasing the purchasing power of the entire population's money. Should government manage the money supply? The fact that government can control the money supply is generally unquestioned by mainstream economic schools and political parties. It's assumed to be the norm, yet there is no evidence to support the assertion that governments should manage the money supply, and overwhelming evidence showing this always ends in economic disaster. Government control over money has been compared to a drug addiction. It fools its victims with a beautiful high at the beginning but the come down is always devastating. Bitcoin has already surpassed the value of most state-backed currencies in the world, and its continued success and steady adoption is strong evidence that governments should not control the money supply. No one can control the supply of Bitcoin, and because of this, it's the best performing asset of all time. Keynesians and Monetarists Keynesians, based on the ideas of John Maynard Keynes, believe that the government can help to stabilize the economy by increasing or decreasing government spending. Monetarists, based on the ideas of Milton Friedman, believe that the government should target a low and stable inflation rate. Both ideologies believe that governments must expand the money supply, which decreases the purchasing power of everyone in the society. Keynes believed that a recession is caused by animal spirits, and that during a recession, the government should spend even more money on government programs, which will create jobs and cause people to spend more money. Keynesians tried to avoid raising taxes to fight recessions, instead relying on government printing and spending of money. Keynes also hated saving money, because saving money reduced overall spending. By printing more money and debasing the money supply, Keynesians hoped to motivate people to spend their savings, because it's always decreasing in value over time. 
Monetarists generally oppose spending money to eliminate unemployment. Instead, monetarists prefer to cut taxes to stimulate the economy. They argue that the extra money people get from tax cuts is better spent by citizens than by governments. While the Keynesians and the monetarists have different methods of stimulating economic growth, they both require government spending and increasing the money supply, which in turn lowers the value of everyone's money. Austrian economists, on the other hand, believe that money itself is a good, like any other commodity, and is not outside the free market forces. Money is the most desired and the most easily sold commodity of all. Like all other commodities, money should be strictly limited in supply. If the money supply is limited, it will increase in value over time, forcing governments and citizens to be careful and thoughtful about how it is spent. Bitcoin is the first provably scarce commodity in history, which is why it is such a technological breakthrough and why it is so important. Even gold, which is the second most scarce commodity, has an unknown supply in the Earth's crust. Recently, a deposit of gold was discovered in Africa that would double the supply of gold. This can't happen with Bitcoin. According to the Austrian School of Economics, if the money supply is fixed, which is really only recently possible with Bitcoin, prices of goods and services will decrease over time, causing people to save their money because it will buy more in the future. This also massively de-incentivizes war because of its destructive nature and extreme expense. Unsound Money and Perpetual War It is no coincidence that the era of central bank-controlled currency began with the First World War in human history. There are three fundamental reasons that government money incentivizes war. Number one, fiat, or government money, is a barrier to trade between countries because it is not universal and issued by each country's government. Number two, government's ability to print money allows it to print money until its currency completely collapses in value. With sound money, like gold, the government's war efforts were limited to their supply of gold and taxes. Number three, societies with sound money are incentivized to cooperate with other countries because it's in everyone's economic interest to cooperate instead of destroying each other. Limited versus Omnipotent Government Liberalism triumphed on the principle that the best government is that which governs the least. Now, for all the Western nations, political wisdom has recast this ideal into liberality. The shift has thrown the vocabulary into disorder. Jacques Barzun It can be argued that liberalism has been replaced with liberality in the 20th century. Liberalism means that the role of government is to allow citizens to live in liberty, while also suffering the consequences of their own actions. Liberality means that the role of government is to allow citizens to live in liberty, while protecting them from the consequences of doing so. The classical ideal of liberalism is only possible in a system of sound money like gold or bitcoin, because sound money acts as a natural financial restraint against government authoritarianism and overreach. As long as government operations are limited to tax income, they are restricted to what citizens deem appropriate. When governments can print money infinitely, it doesn't really matter what the citizens want and inevitably leads to an authoritarian government. It's no coincidence that the most horrific tyrants of history operated in a system of unlimited fiat or government-issued money. Vladimir Lenin Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler, Pol Pot, Mussolini, Kim Jong-il, and many others are examples of the dangers of this unchecked spending. The Bezel Any money that can be easily produced leads to people producing more of it, which in turn drives the value of the money down. There is no societal benefit from increasing the money supply. In free societies, the money which is hardest to produce always ends up being chosen for this reason. The money which was hardest to produce for thousands of years was gold, but now that distinction has been taken over by Bitcoin, which is the first and only provably scarce thing in the world. 
For both John Maynard Keynes and Milton Friedman, one of the main attractions of abandoning the gold standard was that printing money was far cheaper to produce than mining gold. What they failed to realize was that the high cost of mining gold was a feature, not a bug. The difficulty and expense of mining gold was precisely why it was valuable and was what kept its supply low relative to all other commodities. In addition, both Keynes and Friedman ignored the real costs of printing money, which was not the physical creation of the paper money, but in the resulting huge increase of borrowing cheap money, causing record amounts of debt. This debt explosion is what economist John Kenneth Galbraith called the bezel. The bezel is the name which describes the process of huge amounts of embezzlement that occurred in the 1920s, right before the Great Depression. Because loans were so easy to get in the 1920s under the fiat monetary system, huge numbers of unprofitable and fraudulent projects were funded. This led to the Great Economic Crash of 1929, followed by the Great Depression. This would not have been possible under a sound money standard, using gold or Bitcoin as the reserve asset. Chapter 8. Digital Money Bitcoin is the first digital solution to the problem of money and has the potential to offer individuals sovereignty over a form of money that is resistant to unexpected inflation and highly saleable across space, time, and scale. Bitcoin as Digital Cash Before Bitcoin was invented, one could divide payment methods into two distinct categories. Number 1. Cash Payments these were carried out in person between two parties. These payments were immediate, final, and required no trust from either party. Each party gets what they want instantly. The drawback is that both people need to be physically present at the transaction, a problem that is growing as time passes. Number two, intermediated payments. These are payments which require a trusted third party. This includes checks, credit cards, debit cards, bank wire transfers, money transfer services, electronic payments like PayPal, Venmo, etc. The advantage is that the two parties do not need to be in the same place at the same time to transact. The drawbacks are trusting the third party to execute the transaction, fraud, three to five business days to settle, and government surveillance and blocking of the transactions. Satoshi Nakamoto's goal with Bitcoin was to create a digital cash system that did not require a third party, settled in 10 minutes, and in which fraud, or double spending, was impossible. Ralph Merkel, inventor of the Merkle tree data structure, which is utilized by Bitcoin, describes Bitcoin in the following way. Bitcoin is the first example of a new form of life. It lives and breathes on the internet. It lives because it can pay people to keep it alive. It lives because it performs a useful service that people will pay it to perform. It lives because anyone, anywhere, can run a copy of its code. It lives because all the running copies are constantly talking to each other. It lives because if any one copy is corrupted, it is discarded, quickly and without any fuss or muss. It lives because it is radically transparent. Anyone can see its code and see exactly what it does. It can't be changed. It can't be argued with. It can't be tampered with. It can't be corrupted. It can't be stopped. It can't even be interrupted. If nuclear war destroyed half our planet, it would continue to live uncorrupted. It would continue to offer its services. It would continue to pay people to keep it alive. Supply, Value, and Transactions Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency with a predetermined low rate of supply growth that is maintained by a network of computers. The supply of Bitcoin increases at a decreasing rate through the issuance of new blocks, which are added to the shared ledger roughly every 10 minutes and require the solving of proof-of-work problems. The block reward, which is the number of new Bitcoins issued with each block, is programmed to cut in half every 210,000 blocks, or roughly every four years. The supply of Bitcoin will asymptotically approach 21 million coins around the year 2140, at which point no more Bitcoins will be issued. 
The cost of producing a Bitcoin generally rises along with the market price as more nodes enter to compete for the block reward and raise the difficulty of the proof-of-work problems. Bitcoin's low, predetermined rate of supply growth, which cannot be arbitrarily increased by any authority, is a key factor in its appreciation in value. When demand for Bitcoin increases, the only way for the market to meet this demand is for the price to rise enough to incentivize holders to sell some of their Bitcoin. This has contributed to the significant increase in the purchasing power of Bitcoin, which has gone from a fraction of a penny in its first recorded transaction in 2009 to over $28,000 in 2023 at the time of recording this video. The total market value of all Bitcoins in circulation was around $530 billion in 2023, making it the 22nd largest national currency in the world in terms of broad money supply. At one point in 2022, Bitcoin had become the fourth largest world currency by market cap, behind the Chinese yuan, US dollar, and the euro, surpassing the Japanese yen in total value. Appendix to Chapter 8 There are three important technologies used by Bitcoin. Hashing Hashing is a mathematical process that turns data into a fixed-size hash value making it easy to identify, but impossible to determine the original data from the hash. It is used in various aspects of Bitcoin, including digital signatures, proof of work, and transaction identifiers. Public Key Cryptography This allows for secure authentication through the use of a private key, which generates a public key, and one or more signatures. In Bitcoin, the private key is used to access the owner's bitcoins, while the public key is widely shared to verify transactions. A peer-to-peer -peer network. This is a decentralized network in which all members have equal privileges and responsibilities. Bitcoin uses a peer-to-peer -peer network to share the ledger of all transactions, similar to how BitTorrent shares files through a network of users. Unlike centralized networks, Peer-to-peer -peer networks are resistant to being shut down or controlled by a single entity. Chapter 9. What is Bitcoin good for? Store of value. Store of value refers to the belief that certain resources, such as gold or Bitcoin, can maintain their value over time and can be used as a means of exchange or as a way to store wealth. However, the concept of scarcity, which is the foundation of economics, is often misunderstood. While it is true that some resources may be more rare or difficult to extract than others, the absolute quantity of all raw materials on Earth is vast and cannot be considered a true limit to what humans can produce. The real limit is the amount of time and labor that goes into producing a good or service, as time is the only truly scarce resource. In fact, the proven reserves of many resources have increased over time as technology has advanced, allowing for more efficient production and extraction. The rarity of a resource determines its relative cost, but the ultimate limit on production is the opportunity cost of producing one good or service over another. Individual Sovereignty Individual sovereignty refers to the idea that individuals should have the freedom to make their own choices and decisions without interference from external authorities such as governments. Bitcoin, as a decentralized digital currency, enables individuals to have more control over their financial transactions and allows them to escape the financial control of governments. The rise of new technologies, such as the internet and information communication, has also allowed for the subversion of traditional forms of regulation and the emergence of alternative forms of organization, giving individuals more power and sovereignty in their personal and professional lives. These developments have the potential to reduce the importance and power of the nation state and to give individuals greater freedom and autonomy. International and Online Settlement Bitcoin has created a new independent alternative mechanism for international settlement that operates separately from the traditional financial infrastructure. It allows individuals to send money without permission from anyone and without exposing their identity, and its decentralized nature makes it difficult for governments to confiscate. 
Its blockchain also makes it impractical for authorities to act as a lender of last resort for banks dealing with Bitcoin. And its cryptographic digital certainty can expose banks engaging in fractional reserve banking. Bitcoin also has the potential to become a world reserve currency. Bitcoin has achieved a significant degree of global liquidity and has the potential to be used for international payments at lower cost than existing options. It can offer final settlement of large volume payments within minutes, making it a competitor to settlement payments between central banks and large financial institutions. It is a neutral money that is not tied to any specific country's economy and is not dependent on its economic performance, making it a more attractive store of value proposition than national currencies. Its capacity for transactions is more than enough for a global network of central banks to perform daily final settlement with one another over the Bitcoin network, potentially covering the entire world's population. In a world where no government can create more Bitcoins, these central banks would compete with one another to offer physical and digital Bitcoin-backed monetary instruments and payment solutions. Global Unit of Account Bitcoin has the potential to be used as a global unit of account for trade and economic activity. For this to happen, it would need to be adopted by a large number of people worldwide, likely indirectly through its use as a reserve currency. If Bitcoin's share of the global money supply and international settlement transactions becomes a majority, demand for it will become more predictable, leading to a stabilization in the value of the currency. The predictability of Bitcoin's supply along with the consistent exponential growth in the number of users, may make daily fluctuations in demand less significant determinants of price. For Bitcoin to be used as a global unit of account, it would mean that it was widely accepted as a medium of exchange and a store of value. Chapter 10, Bitcoin Questions. With the economic basics explained in Chapter 8, and the main use cases for Bitcoin discussed in Chapter 9, a few of the most important questions about Bitcoin's operation are examined here. Is Bitcoin mining a waste? There is a common criticism that Bitcoin mining is wasteful due to its high energy consumption. Bitcoin mining involves solving complex mathematical problems to validate transactions and add them to the blockchain, a public ledger. Successful miners are rewarded with newly minted Bitcoins, providing an incentive for participants. The energy consumption of Bitcoin mining is significant, but it serves a valuable purpose. It secures the Bitcoin network, making it extremely difficult for any entity to manipulate transaction records. This security is fundamental to Bitcoin's operation as a decentralized currency, free from the control of any government or organization. Out of control, why nobody can change Bitcoin. The nature of Bitcoin is such that once version 0.1 was released, the core design was set in stone for the rest of its lifetime. Satoshi Nakamoto, June 17, 2010. Unlike traditional currencies, the production of Bitcoin is not controlled by a centralized authority. Instead, it's algorithmically defined and executed by miners, making it resistant to manipulation. Bitcoin's decentralization and the immutability of its monetary policy are important features that protect it from inflation and political interference. These attributes are seen as a response to the issues of the traditional financial system, where centralized control often leads to economic problems like hyperinflation. Anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is a unique characteristic of Bitcoin's design that makes it not just robust, but anti-fragile, a term coined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. An anti-fragile system is one that improves or gains from disorder and volatility rather than merely withstanding it. Bitcoin's anti-fragility stems from its decentralized design and the incentivized nature of its mining process. Unlike centralized systems that can be brought down by a single failure point, Bitcoin's decentralized network becomes more secure with more participants, even in the face of potential attacks. Can Bitcoin scale? The question of whether Bitcoin can scale to accommodate a growing user base is a significant one. As Bitcoin has grown in popularity, the amount of transactions has increased, putting a strain on the network's capacity. Solutions proposed include increasing the block size or implementing various technical improvements to optimize the processing of transactions. One of the most promising solutions is the Lightning Network, 
a second layer protocol that operates on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. The Lightning Network allows users to open payment channels between each other, where multiple transactions can be made without committing all of them to the blockchain. Only the final balance is recorded on the blockchain when the payment channel is closed. This method drastically increases the transaction capacity of the Bitcoin network. The development of protocols like the Lightning Network offers promising avenues for Bitcoin to scale while maintaining its decentralization and security. Is Bitcoin for criminals? There's a common misconception about Bitcoin. It's alleged association with criminal activities. The anonymous nature of Bitcoin transactions has led some to believe that the cryptocurrency is primarily used for illicit activities. However, this perception is not accurate. It's important to note that while Bitcoin transactions can be pseudonymous, which is not directly linked to the real world identities, they are not completely anonymous. Every Bitcoin transaction is recorded on the blockchain, a public ledger that anyone can inspect. Therefore, with the right tools and information, it is possible to trace Bitcoin transactions back to their participants. According to various studies, only a small percentage of Bitcoin transactions are connected to illicit activities. Most Bitcoin users are individuals and businesses who use the cryptocurrency for legitimate purposes, such as investment, remittances, or as a hedge against inflation. How to Kill Bitcoin, a Beginner's Guide This section explores seven potential threats to Bitcoin's survival. Let's summarize each point. Number one, hacking. Bitcoin's simple design, vast processing power, and distributed consensus make it highly resistant to attacks. Hacking Bitcoin would require corrupting the transaction ledger in a way that would be costly, risky, and likely detected by nodes in the network. The 51% attack. This involves a miner controlling a large percentage of the hash rate to generate fraudulent transactions. While technically possible, it's economically disadvantageous as it would undermine trust in Bitcoin and decrease its value. Criminals do not want to decrease in value that which they steal. Number three, hardware backdoors. It's technically feasible to corrupt hardware running Bitcoin software, allowing outside parties to access or control it. This could damage Bitcoin's reputation and demand. However, as Bitcoin mining grows and diversifies its hardware providers, this risk decreases. Number four, internet and infrastructure attacks. Shutting down key communications infrastructure or the entire internet is often suggested as a way to kill Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin is a software protocol that doesn't rely on specific hardware or infrastructure. Disabling all internet connections simultaneously would cause significant damage to society and is highly unlikely to stop Bitcoin. In addition, there is a dedicated Bitcoin satellite that would continue to operate regardless of the entire internet being shut down. Number five, rise in cost of nodes and drop in their numbers. If the cost of running a Bitcoin node significantly increases, fewer people will run them, reducing the network's decentralization. This is a serious technical threat as a network with few nodes could be manipulated or sabotaged more easily. Number six, the breaking of the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. If the SHA-256 hashing function were broken, all Bitcoin addresses would become vulnerable. The fix would be to switch to a stronger encryption method, but coordinating this change could be challenging. Quantum-resistant hashing algorithms already exist and could be implemented. Number seven, a return to sound money. If the world's banking and monetary systems were replaced with a gold standard, demand for Bitcoin might decrease. However, this is highly unlikely as such concepts are unfamiliar to most politicians and voters worldwide. The creation of a new form of sound money superior to Bitcoin could also threaten it, but Bitcoin's unique, decentralized design makes this highly unlikely. While there are several potential threats to Bitcoin, its design and the economic incentives surrounding it make it highly resilient. Altcoins. This section discusses the rise of alternative cryptocurrencies, also known as altcoins. Most of these altcoins are essentially cryptocurrencies based on Bitcoin's blueprint, but with certain modified rules. However, these altcoins fail to challenge Bitcoin's dominant position. Despite their surface similarities to Bitcoin, altcoins often miss one key aspect, immutability. Bitcoin's value isn't derived from its speed or user friendliness, but from its immutable monetary policy, which can't be easily tampered with. Any cryptocurrency created by tweaking Bitcoin's specifications inherently lacks this immutability. As a result, 
None of the altcoins have been able to replicate the unique combination of features that give Bitcoin its value and staying power. Therefore, the proliferation of altcoins does not pose a substantial threat to Bitcoin. The blockchain technology that underpins Bitcoin is often hyped as a solution to various economic and social problems, but this is largely due to a lack of understanding of how Bitcoin actually works. Blockchain technology is not an efficient, cheap, or fast way of transacting online, but it does eliminate the need to trust in third-party intermediaries. However, it can only eliminate third-party intermediation when it comes to moving a native token of the network itself. In other words, a non-Bitcoin blockchain combines the cumbersome structure of the blockchain with the cost and security risk of trusted third parties. A lose-lose situation. Potential Applications of Blockchain Technology There are three main potential applications of blockchain technology. Number one, digital payments. Blockchain has been used for digital payments, most notably in Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin's blockchain is not designed for speed or low cost, but for removing the need for trust in third-party intermediaries. For centralized currencies, recording transactions in a centralized manner will always be more efficient. Number two, contracts. Smart contracts, such as those on the Ethereum network, aim to encode contracts into a blockchain to make them self-executing and beyond the reach of courts and police. However, this raises several issues, including the complexity and potential bugs in code and the ability of operators to override the contract's execution. Number three, database and record management. Blockchain can provide a reliable and tamper-proof database and asset register, but only for the blockchain's native currency. For any other asset, the reliability of the blockchain is as good as the party responsible for linking the asset to the blockchain. Thus, a blockchain without a currency is unworkable. While blockchain technology has potential, its real-world applications are limited and often less efficient than existing technologies. For a blockchain to be useful, it must have a native currency and must be decentralized, as in the case of Bitcoin. The economic drawbacks of a blockchain technology. There are five main drawbacks, which are obstacles to the adoption of blockchain technology. Number one, redundancy. The costly redundancy of having every transaction recorded with every member of the network adds increased costs with no benefit for the intermediaries. Number two, scaling. A distributed network where all the nodes record all transactions will have a storage and computational burden that is far larger than a centralized network of the same size, making it harder for effective scaling. Number three, regulatory compliance. Regulations were designed for an infrastructure much different from that of a blockchain, and the rules cannot be easily tailored to fit blockchain operation, making it difficult to ensure compliance with all the rules. Number four, irreversibility. Human and software errors occur frequently in banking, and employing a blockchain structure makes errors more costly to fix due to the irreversibility of cash transactions. Number five, security. The security of a blockchain database is entirely reliant on the expenditure of processing power on the verification of transactions and proof of work, and is compromised by operating on a shared ledger, which opens up many possibilities for security breaches to take place. Blockchain technology as a mechanism for producing electronic cash. The only successful use of blockchain technology is for electronic cash, specifically Bitcoin, other applications such as payments, contracts, and asset registry only work using the blockchain's decentralized currency. Any application of blockchain technology will only make sense if it relies on electronic cash and disintermediation provides economic benefits. The design of blockchain for electronic cash does not suit other functions, and after many years and many millions of users, it has not produced other commercial products other than Bitcoin. Blockchain is better understood as an integral part of the machine that creates Bitcoin. Please like, subscribe, and check out the next video.